Hey guys, this is Mark Goldberg from Mark Vlogs Watches with a quick video following up on yesterday's Omega Seamaster 300 meter SMP professional reference number, eh, forget it. It's the new 2018 42 millimeter. I hate the way you have to identify, that's better. I hate the way that you have to identify an Omega. It's so much longer than the Submariner's reference numbers and the Rolex reference numbers. Anyway, before I just continue ranting on like a complete horological maniac, let's go ahead and get the quick fist watch check out of the way. And what do you think it's going to be? Of course, it's the Seamaster in question. Okay, guys, you know what? It's kind of an interesting weather situation that we're having. So let's go outside and talk about this. Okay, now here's the thing. I am in the Chicago suburbs. I am a dog trainer, so I'm on the edge of the city. It is April, it is April 27th, and it's snowing like a banshee. Now, what I wanna talk about briefly is uh, do I have buyer's remorse? That is what I'm going to title. That's what I'm going to title this. Uh, and you know, my the people who are long-term subscribers to this channel know that I'm a complete Rolex fanboy. I'm I'm worse than a than an Apple guy, which I also am. You know, an iPhone guy. But I'm even worse when it comes to Rolex. But do I have buyer's remorse? In a word, no. Like, listen, there are flaws that this watch has. And, uh, you know, maybe there's flaws that the Submariner has. I'm going to have to think about that one because, uh, to be honest with you, I don't think the Submariner has too many flaws. Um, but the the Omega has a couple. You're looking at one, you know, you're right there. There's one of the flaws. It's called the wart. But, you know, I mean, maybe we should just call this, you know, people who are familiar with Archie Luxury, maybe for obvious reasons, we should just call this watch the AC3. But it is gorgeous. And no, I don't have buyer's remorse. I'm in love with this watch. By the way, I got this from Nick over at ExquisiteTimePieces.com. And um, the reason I mention that is because Nick was such a pleasure to deal with. This is a hard to source watch. And um, Exquisite Timepieces carries like 50 brands. So, you know, look, look these guys up. Anyway back to the buyer's remorse. How could I have buyer's remorse? Now, I, uh, I, I, I'm I working very hard. Let me just interject a quick commercial. For me, <laughs> I'm working hard. I want to be your one of your favorite YouTube watch gurus. I don't expect to be the primary guy. There's too many good people out there. AC3, Bruce Williams, Guy over at Just Blue Fish Watches, Adrian at Bark and Jack, now the Gin Tingler, the Rancher. I mean, the list goes on and on. I just want to be one of them. I want to be somewhere in the mix. So please, dear God, subscribe. It's free. This week only. Okay. Oh, and like. All that. Okay. Now, how could I possibly have buyer's remorse? Look at the look at the play on that dial. Okay. What don't I like about it? Um, I don't love that little wart there. The, the helium escape valve that is completely useless, completely unnecessary. And uh, this bezel is beautiful. It's a little hard to see in this kind of gray dull light, but that is a very attractive blue. And um, what a dynamic dial. I mean, there's just every which way we turn it, it just continually looks different, which I love. I mean, it's a very simple classic looking dial on the one hand. On the other hand, there is so much action of light on those laser etched waves and on that chrome bezel and chrome, chrome dial so much interplay of light that it actually gets a little distracting and busy. But uh, buyer's remorse? No. That, <laughs> no, I don't. Now, um, where this is going to factor into rotation, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I got distracted. The bezel. We have to talk about the bezel, and I'm going to make a whole video where I go into great detail about the bezel. Um, and uh, however, after before I finish this video, I'm going to turn this camera around and I'll show you what my objection is. Uh, and it's not what you think. I think you might be surprised about what my objection to the bezel is. Let's just say the bezel insert in ceramic is gorgeous. I heard somebody say the loom pip is too small. Well, I, I mean, come on, get over yourself. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm anal too, but I'm not worried about the loom pip. It glows. That's all I care about. Um, but on, you know, on balance, I, you're just getting a lot of looks at the wrist shots here. You know, on balance, it's a thing of beauty with the, 
I, I would say that the, the, the adjustable Omega clasp is um, just, you know, inches behind in beauty and gorgeousness and functionality, just inches behind the Rolex Glidelock clasp. It's not quite as good, but damn near close. And uh, the watch, half the price, you know? Well, yeah, about half the price. So, boy, it's a tremendous value proposition if and only if you are talking about watch for the money. Take resale value and value retention, put that into the mix. Well, you know, then the algorithms all change. Why? Because nothing holds value like Rolex. I, those guys are just printing money over there. You know, these Swiss guys at the Rolex factory, well, let me just say pretty soon, I think they're going to be cloning kidneys and body parts because they turn out a watch with ultimate value retention. And Omega is cranking out a watch, which is technically on some level better, at least in terms of the movement, uh, than the Rolex Submariner, but uh, value retention is not the same. It's decent, but it's not the same. Okay, we're going to turn the camera around. We're going to have a quick look, and I will bitch and complain a little about the bezel, but it's one of the very few complaints that I can make about the Rolex, or about the Omega Seamaster Professional SMP300, <laughs> again with the name. Barely, I barely know what to call it, you know, because there's been so many iterations of the Omega Seamaster that in order to distinguish which one I'm talking about, I'll probably just call it the 42 millimeter Seamaster from now on because that's a lot easier. Okay, what will be coming next will be a point to point comparison video between the Omega and its nearest competitor, which I believe to be the Rolex Submariner, but that is for later next week. Right now, let's take a look at the bezel on this baby. Okay guys, if I were to have any complaint whatsoever about the the watch i think my primary complaint would be not about the knurling here okay these are scalloped knurls they're shallow they're difficult to grip i'm kind of in the snow so my fingers are a little wet i had an old eta version of this watch that dated back into the 90s and that thing was impossible to grip impossible to turn very difficult so because of all that criticism what omega went and did was they made it much lighter. They made the turn much lighter. Oh, wow. I'm discovering a completely new criticism, and that is it's impossible to do when wet. Because when it's dry... Oh, I'm <laughs> silly me. I was turning it the wrong way. Okay. Let's pretend that we really know something about watches. Naturally, it goes counterclockwise. Anyway, the, the turning action of it, in my opinion, is too light. So, the f listen, there is zero back play. It's a definite lock into position. It doesn't get stuck between positions. But there is just something mildly unsatisfying about the turning sensation and turning sound of the bezel, especially when you're comparing it to the Rolex Submariner, which is basically sex in a bezel. Well, if that's the worst thing I can say about the Omega, it's not all that bad. But hey. Not everybody's going to be a Rolex, but look what we get here for half the price. Well, this is Mark Goldberg. I'm going to get out of the snow. Thanks for being with me. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, do all that. Leave me a comment, and thanks for being with me, guys. Peace out. Mm -hmm.